Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Hope everybody's doing well today. It is Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. And I see folks joining on. Good morning, Diana and Debbie, Lyle, Mr. Danny, Roger and Anita. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we are ready for Revelation chapter 10. So hopefully you have your Bible ready. And, uh, hey, good morning, Wayne. Glad to see you on here. If you have any questions or comments, as always, feel free to add them to the comment section here, and I'll address them as I see them. We are going to, let me go ahead and pull up your outline here so it'll be up on the screen for you, and you can see what's going on. All right, so I've got a little bit of a summary so far. <clears throat> Of what we've studied here at the top of this outline. So John's visions and prophecies up to this point have revealed that God is on the throne, Revelation 4 and 5, that God is going to judge the evil world, chapter 6, that God's people are known and marked, sealed, Revelation chapter 7, that God hears and answers the prayers of his people, chapter 8, and that the Christian's persecutor, Rome, was going to fall, that's chapter 9. Now, chapter 10 is an interesting chapter because it kind of serves as what I call a launching pad into further visions, further revelations of the book that portray for us the battle that's taking place between the dragon and the lamb, all right, between Satan and his, adver and his uh, not adversaries, his helpers, and Christ and his people. Good morning, Mom. Good to see you on here. So that's Revelation, that's where we are this morning, Revelation chapter 10. So the first four verses, this is a message for all mankind. And there's something that, I, that you need to pay attention to that comes out three times in Revelation chapter 10, and I will point that out uh, as we go through here. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with, a cl clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So again, this... This image, this vision that John sees is very colorful, very descriptive. Uh, of course, the rainbow, what do we think of when we think of a rainbow uh, in, in context of biblical history? Well, we think of Noah's day, don't we? God's covenant, that is God's promise. And so we might keep that in mind. And of course, also here we have um, his face was like the sun, okay, great brightness. And then his feet like pillars of fire, strength, uh, judgment, the idea behind fire. All right, so notice where this angel, and by the way, this is not a reference to Jesus. Jesus is never in Scripture referred to as an angel. Anyway, notice here in verse 2 that the text tells us this. I'm just adjusting some things on my screen here. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, that's mentioned three times in this chapter where his feet are placed. It's mentioned here in verse 2, and then in verse 5, and then in verse 8. And the idea behind that part of this vision is that this message, whatever's in this little book, is going to apply to everybody on earth. All right, his, his foot is, in the, is on the land <clears throat> and on the sea universal application here of what John is getting ready to see and what you and I are getting ready to read about. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And of course, when we think of thunderings, we think of the voice of God. We think of what happened on Sinai, Exodus chapters 19 and 20. And that's again mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12. And this idea of thundering a thundering voice is prevalent throughout the revelation here. John does something in response to that, which he's been used to doing, and in fact, in the very beginning of the revelation was commanded to do, and that is to write. So notice here, the seven thunders utter their voices, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So guess what? We don't know what they said. John was told not to write them. All right, so that's all I can say about that. 
Um, now, I put in your outline here, John is told to seal up the things. Well, Daniel was told the same thing about one of his messages, Daniel chapter 12. Whatever was written and sealed, we don't know what it was. So we can't speculate on that because that's exactly what it would be. It'd be nothing but speculation on our part. So then we have verses 5 through 7. Now, a message is revealed. One is told, don't write it down. But then we have this one, the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land. Again, that's the second time. And the concept is of a universal message raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel. All right. So let's let's stop right there for just a second. So the book of Revelation, when we go back to chapter 5, presents us with a scroll that has seven seals. The Lamb opens those seven seals and reveals certain things to John. That's chapter 6 and chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there are now seven trumpets that are going to sound. We've looked at trumpets 1 through 6, all right, and that's been chapters uh, 8 and 9. The seventh trumpet doesn't sound until chapter 11 that we have, uh, as we have it. Chapter 11, beginning in verse, what is it, verse uh, verse 15. So what John's telling us here in verses 5 through 7 is, we're going to hear that soon. And when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, and uh, as he declared to his servants the prophets. So again, a couple of things here on this. The idea of a mystery is mentioned quite often in your New Testament, and it always refers to the salvation of God's people. Just for instance, and I have this here in your outline, Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. Paul talks about the gospel that he preached, the mystery that had been revealed to him, and the mystery was how the Gentiles could be saved just like the Jews. That's a universal message that Paul preached to everybody. God's scheme of redemption for all of mankind. That's what we're talking about. Because, you know, to a Jewish mind, God is their God. He lived in Jerusalem. He lived in the temple. He wasn't anybody else's God but theirs. Well, that runs completely contrary to the gospel uh, and, and completely contrary to what Jesus preached. And so that's the mystery. A mystery is something that nobody knows until it's revealed. Well, that's what the gospel is. And that's what the salvation for all of mankind is. It, it wasn't just limited to Jewish people. It was universal in its scope. And that's the message that we're seeing here. And John says when that seven trumpets, seventh trumpet sounds, or that seven angel sounds, we're going to see this. Um, and it's not going to be much longer. And again, for us, the way we have the book of Revelation divided up, it's, it's going to be in chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. All right, so keep all that in mind. Rome had, as I put in your outline here, had set, set itself directly against uh, the church directly against uh, Christianity. Again, whether you believe Revelation was written before A.D. 70 and under the persecution of Nero, or you believe it was written near the end of the first century in the persecution of Domitian. Frankly, that really doesn't matter. The point being, their persecution against Christianity was brutal. But there's something that's going to be sounded shortly. It's a mystery right now, but it's going to be revealed when that seventh angel sounds Again, we'll get to it in chapter 11, planning for tomorrow. All right, so now we get to chapter, I'm sorry, now we get to verse 8 in chapter 10 here. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. And again, that's the third time now that we're told this angel is on the has one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. And again, that, that's, that's the idea of a universal message. This applies to everybody on earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. Well, what is a book? A, a book coming from heaven, coming in the hand of an angel, would be some type of revelation from God. That's what we're talking about. Now, this is a little book. You have a scroll in Revelation chapter 5. We have this imagery in the book of Ezekiel. We have it in the book of Daniel. This is not uncommon biblical language, is, in, is my point. And this, it always refers to some type of revelation from God. Well, this is a, a revelation from God. So what is John told to do with it in verse 9? Take and eat it. Ingest God's Word. Ingest this revelation. All right? It's going to be bitter, 
to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. A bittersweet message. My personal belief is, and I have it here in your outline, the rest of the book of Revelation is what we're dealing with here. The first 10 chapters, in my opinion, really set the stage for chapters 11 through 22. You have a context set, you have an audience set, you have certain visions that are given to John, and now John's told, I want you to take this message, it's going to be bittersweet, but you need to take it in. Um, so he takes it, verse 10, it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, and here you go, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's why I think this little book that he took in, that he ate, that was sweet, that became bitter, is the rest of the book of Revelation. It's sweet because the, the overall, the, the broad scope of Revelation is that of victory. All right, you look again at Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. There's a war made with the Lamb, but the Lamb overcomes. That's the overreaching message of Revelation. But throughout that larger picture, if you will, that broader picture is constant persecution, constant difficulty uh, for, for God's people at large. And we'll really see that in chapter 12 uh, as we get there. This is... Um, again, a bittersweet message. Now, when you look at verse 11, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Again, I think of this angel that three times we're told had his foot, one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. This applies to everybody. And see, that's, that's one of the important things about Revelation, the book of Revelation, and this is one thing I've said repeatedly throughout this study. Don't miss the forest for the trees. So many people get tangled up in trying to nail down every little detail in the book of Revelation that, that they, I've seen some people, in fact, just get frustrated and give up. Um, in fact, tomorrow, the chapter, uh, chapter 11 that we're going to study tomorrow is an interesting chapter, obviously for its content, but also for the, for the reaction that a lot of different people have towards the content of that chapter. There's a lot of division over what it means, and it's because they're, they're missing the bigger picture trying to figure out small details that, frankly, are not revealed to us. And that's one of the keys to understanding the book of Revelation. Um, not everything is revealed to us. Again, so go back up into chapter 10. Um, what is it? Verses, verses 3 and 4. So John hears these seven thunders, and he picks up his pen. He's about to write, and he said, no. He's told, no, don't write this. The fact of the matter is, in the book of Revelation, some things are not explained to us. So for us to speculate on certain things, again, as I've already said this morning, would be just that. It would be nothing but speculation. And that's not going to do anybody any good. That's, if, if anything, that's going to cause more division uh, and more misunderstanding. So don't miss the forest for the trees. And I know I've said that a lot, but that's, I tell you, that's one of the well, I heard a lecture a couple weeks ago on the book of Revelation, and in the, in the process of him kind of introducing the book and giving the, the major themes of the book and things like this, one of the things he said was that we need, when, we, when we approach the book of Revelation, we need to be humble enough to admit that we don't know everything. And I couldn't agree with that, with that any more than I do. I don't know what every single symbol and number and color and horse and all of this represents. But I can see things that are revealed, not only in the book of Revelation, but through a knowledge of other parts of your Bible, and again, specifically, particularly old, particular Old Testament passages that do give me some details. So we have to appreciate that <laughs> I don't know everything about it, you don't know everything about it, um, but there is a larger... A larger picture that we are to get from it. Now that does not mean that um, we should kind of shove Revelation off to the side, not try to study it, and not try to understand it. It's not what I'm saying at all. I think you understand what I'm saying. Uh, but anyway, Revelation chapter 10, I really do believe is the 
beginning point of the rest of the book. I think the little book that's bittersweet that John eats here is the rest of Revelation. Because again, once you start reading in chapter 11 and then in chapter 12 and 13, when the battle really heats up between, again, between the dragon and his servants and Christ and his servants, it's bitter. I mean, it's, it's terrible. And when you look back even into secular history and you look at the Roman persecution of Christianity, it was brutal. Again, whether you want to talk about Nero or Domitian and have that discussion, it was brutal. It's bitter, but it's sweet because of the ultimate end result. And that really starts for us in chapter 17 all the way through uh, chapter 22, where we see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and God's people are victorious and God's people are comforted and rewarded because they overcame. And again, overcome is the key, key word, if you will, throughout the book of Revelation. You know, just for instance, to each of the seven churches of Asia, you have, you know, warnings and, and uh, encouragement, things of this nature. But every, to every one, it said, he who overcomes will, and then, you know, fill in the blank, whatever they were told. That's your big picture. The Christian can overcome because we're on Christ's side. We're with the Lamb. All right, he's victorious. We know that. So uh, Revelation chapter 10 is an interesting chapter, and it's, it leads us into a study of the rest of the book. All right, folks, that's what I've got for today. A little bit shorter video, but the chapter is only 11 verses long, so there's just not a lot you can say uh, than what we've said. So if you, I don't see any questions or comments on here this morning. I usually get some after the videos, and that's fine. I'll respond to those as I see them. I had some requests. Yeah, okay, so Wayne, absolutely Wayne, just shared Deuteronomy 29, 29. Now that's in, in reference to the law of Moses, but I think this applies across the board in the general sense of, God, of God's revelation. The secret things belong to God, but those things which He has revealed to us belong unto us and to our children that we may, that we may do all the words of this law. Absolutely. Good passage, Wayne. Thanks for sharing that. So I've had several requests for the material. I've sent it out. Uh, if you would like, I've, I've got a, I've got two documents. Number one is a kind of like a introductory guide to understanding the book of Revelation, and then I have the, the outline that we're looking at each day. So if you want those, let me know, and I'll be happy to send them to you. Diane asks, but throughout all of this, he is speaking to the churches only, right? Well, that's that's the um, or that was the. The initial, um, what am I trying, the audience, yes. They were the initial recipients. And see, that's, that's the case with every book of the Bible, okay? Just for instance. So Revelation is written to the seven churches of Asia. All right, so you open Galatians chapter 1, and Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia. Now, Galatia, Galatia was not a city, it was a region. And there were apparently multiple congregations in that region. That was the target audience of that. And that's what I mean, and you've probably heard me say this before, the Bible was not written to me. It was written for me. The Bible was written to specific uh, individuals like Timothy uh, by Paul, or it was written to specific congregations, or perhaps even specific groups of people. And like, just for instance, you look at the gospel accounts, and, and people have beliefs like, for instance, they believe the book of Matthew was written to a largely Jewish audience because of its Jewish references to to Jesus as the son of David and the kingdom and things like this. And that's all fine and good. But yes, um, John is speaking to those seven churches of Asia. But there are also many things that we can learn from it. And I think that's how we should approach any book of the Bible. How do I know, just for instance, how do I know what to do to be saved? Was it because God wrote a letter directly to me? Or was it because I have the record of what Jesus taught and what his apostles taught to, oh, to the, to the people on Pentecost in Acts 2? Or to, um, to the church in Corinth in Acts chapter 19? That's what I mean when I say the Bible was not written to me, but for me. And every book of the Bible, all 66, they're all like that. But certainly the, the seven churches of Asia were the... Uh, primary recipients, the primary audience of that letter. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, well, if there's not anything else, I don't see anything else. Sometimes it pops up after I say that, and I think it was yesterday. 
I said, I'll see you on the next video. And I hit end and a question popped up. So <laughs> sometimes it happens that way. But I appreciate y'all being on here today. If there's anything further, you can still comment after the video's over. I appreciate you being on here today. And I plan on seeing you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And we will study Revelation chapter 11. And we'll talk about the two witnesses. So have a good day. And I'll see you tomorrow morning.